Using SketchUp in your theatrical scenic designs. This is the first video in this series where we will be discussing how to download SketchUp, the basic tools that you will be using in SketchUp, and we will use those tools specifically to create a basic stage auditorium type uh, arrangement. Uh, so basically uh, your model box that we will in the future be putting uh, your designs in. Let's get started. To begin, you will first need to download SketchUp. To download SketchUp in your search window, you will want to type in SketchUp. You will then go to SketchUp.com and click on the Download SketchUp. You will need to indicate that this is for educational use. Tell a little bit about yourself. Choose your operating system and choose what you want to download. The pro version will cost some money, but you can receive a discount as a student and instructors can even get it for free. We just need SketchUp Make and agree to the license agreement. And unless you want to receive news and tips, you'll want to uncheck the box that says send me SketchUp news and tips. I'm going to go ahead and leave it checked to keep up to date on the newest uh, tools and features, uh, but you probably don't want to. And then click download. The download should begin. When the download is complete, you will want to open that up, agree to the terms, and then install it onto your computer. In my case, I am installing it by dragging and dropping SketchUp 2015 into my Applications folder. I've sped this process up, so it might take you a little bit more time. But once you have completed that process, you can go to your Applications folder. And scroll down to find SketchUp. 2015, click to open SketchUp. Make sure to allow it to open on your computer. I went ahead and closed everything else so that we could focus in on just SketchUp. When you first open SketchUp, you will need to choose a template to use with SketchUp. The templates vary from uh, different styles. Mainly it's about the type of measurement that you want, whether it be in feet and inches, or meters, millimeters, uh, many options. Uh, I like to go with the simple template for feet and inches. And so you click on that and you click on start using SketchUp. I'm going to go ahead and make the screen for SketchUp a little more sizable so that we can zoom in and uh, show you the tools without it being super tiny. So I'll try to make the screen the right size. When you open it for the first time, you have uh, the primary window with the toolbar across the top. Uh, along the bottom, you have a few options on the left, uh, information along the bottom, and then in the right-hand corner down on the bottom is a very important window. This is your measurement window. You have uh, the ground and the sky, and you have three axes. So this is your X, Y, and Z axes. So your green and your red are along the ground layer, and your blue uh, is your vertical axes. So that will be uh, very important. Those three, the green axis, the axis, the red axis, and the blue axis, we'll use those frequently as we continue with our SketchUp work. Other windows that might be open uh, include the layer window, uh, and you can just click on the title of that layer to kind of uh, close it without completely getting rid of it to minimize it. Uh, that's a great way to save space. I'm just gonna tuck these off the, off the page so that we don't have them in our way. The most important window that you'll have that might pop up or that you want to turn on 
if it's not on already is the instructor window. Now, if it's not on and you don't see it, you can go up to the menu above and under the window tab, you can roll down to where it says instructor and clicking on that will turn it on and off. So right now it's minimized and I can open it back up. Closing them requires you to hit the red dot in the upper left hand corner. So opening it back up, I just click there. The instructor window is great mainly because as uh, the name implies, it is an instructor. It will tell you exactly what the tool you have selected does and how you can use it. In this specific instance, I have the select tool selected and to use this tool it will give me it first gives me what that tool does select entities to modify when using other tools or commands it gives me tool operation click on an entity so if I wanted to select this this person I could click that person and he would become selected uh, it also gives me modify keys of, of different ways I can use the tool uh, I can modify the use of that tool by holding down the shift key holding down the command key, holding down the option key, lots of options. Uh, we won't get into too many of these modifier keys. We'll go over a few of those. Uh, but in most tool instances, we will not be covering all of them. For the select tool, I'm actually going to uh, go ahead and get rid of the instructor window. Just since I will be telling you what each of these tools do, uh, I don't think we need the instructor telling us as well. The most important modifier key for the select tool is holding down the shift key. As you can see, when I hold down the shift key, a plus or a minus and a minus sign is added next to my cursor. This allows me to select more than one object. So if there were two of him, I could hold down the select option and select the other version of this person, and that would select him as well. I can hold down the shift key and select something that's currently selected to deselect it. This is really great when you're selecting multiple items and you want to choose exactly which of those items you're selecting. To select multiple items, you can click and drag your selection to make a selection box. So you can just click on a selection or you can make a selection box. Go ahead and try selecting your character and seeing how well, easily that works. Now that we've experimented with the selection tool, let's move on to the eraser tool. The eraser tool is the second tool in the, your toolbox menu. Using the eraser tool, you can click on objects and erase them. Quite easy. I'm going to introduce a very helpful tool that is not on the bar but is your undo tool. Under edit you can go and choose to undo uh, whatever action you did previously. In this case it's undo erase. The quick key for this is the command Z keys pressed together. And from this point forward rather than saying go up to the edit menu and click on undo we will just be using the command Z option to undo. The next tool on your list is looks like a pencil. This is the line tool. You'll notice that it also has a downward triangle, kind of an arrow, indicating that it has multiple tools tucked in under that menu. So these are tools that are considered to be similar and are tucked in together. Let's first experiment with the line tool. Using the pencil, I can click anywhere in my window. And as you can see, that will create the first point of a line. As I move the mouse around, you can see that I am able to create that line at any length I want, in any angle, uh, in any orientation. As I spin around, you'll notice that occasionally it gets highlighted in different colors. It gets highlighted in green and red and blue uh, and when 
it gets highlighted in these colors, that is an indication that it is following the axis. So in this case, it is following the red axis. And a dialog box will appear next to your tool to indicate that it is on the red axis or on the green axis. In the lower right hand corner, you can see that that information box is currently indicating the length of the line that I'm drawing. If I hit the tab key, that will become highlighted and it will allow me to input an exact dimension. In this case, I want to draw an 8 foot line. So I'm going to type in 8 foot, click enter, and it has created an endpoint. If I didn't want to type in an exact distance, I could also just click anywhere to create another endpoint in the line. When I'm done creating endpoints in my line, endpoints or corners, rather, I can hit the escape key to end the line. You can use the line tool to create shapes called surfaces in SketchUp. A shape or surface is a series of lines that are connected to form a closed object. And as soon as you form a closed object, it will cease from being a line tool and will close that object and form a surface. So that surface is now a form in my drawing field. Not only can I select the lines that compose that surface, but I can select the surface itself. I can delete specific lines as I see fit using the delete key when they are selected. Now if I deleted this line over here, it would not affect the other lines. However, if I delete one line that is part of a surface, the surface will go away since it is no longer a closed surface. Below the straight line tool is the freehand tool. Clicking on this allows you to draw curved lines uh, that follow the cursor as you draw it and move it across your, play, your drawing space. To draw these curved lines, you'll need to hold down your click. So you'll need to press your mouse button, click, hold down the click until you are done completing your drawing, the line that you're drawing, and then release the click to finish that line. Another thing to note about lines is how they intersect with each other. I have one line here, and if I take another line and intersect that line, when I select the different lines, instead of being a single line crossed over with another single line, it separates those lines out at that intersection. So I can select the different parts of the line. Now sometimes this is a good thing. Sometimes you're, you're wanting to draw lines and you're wanting them to intersect and you're wanting at those intersections for those lines to break. However, sometimes you don't want that to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo drawing that line. And before I draw that line again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that first line and I'm going to go up to edit and I'm going to select make a group. We're going to use this feature a lot. So in the future, we will refer to this as the quick key option of command G rather than going up to edit and selecting make group. Now when I select that, if I double click it, you can see it puts a bounding box around that line and allows me to edit just that line. If that bounding box around that line is not shown, I am only selecting the group and I can't directly edit it. So if I click on double click on it, if I'm in the group, I can draw a line that intersects it and it will act as it normally does without the group since we are inside of that group and so that when two lines intersect you can select the four different parts of that line. If I'm outside of that group as you can see when I click on it it now selects all of those components that are part of that group 
And if I take another line and I intersect one of those lines, it, no, it does not combine those lines together. It does not separate them at the intersection. It keeps them as their own components. So the items in the group do not mix with the items outside of that group. This is a great way to prevent the things that you are drawing from getting connected when you don't want them to be. I'm going to go ahead and do a group selection of everything on my drawing space except for my, my character. And I'm going to hit the shift key as I select to subtract him from the selection. And I'm just going to go ahead and delete all the lines that I have just drawn. I'd suggest that you pause the video at this point to experiment with the line tool and the freehand tool. All right, now that we've experimented with the line and freehand tool, let's go on to the next tool in our menu. The next tool in our menu is the arc tool. And you can see it also has a drop down arrow indicating that it has several tools within that one tool option. So it's a drop down menu. And this drop down menu combines the different types of arc arcs that are able to be created within SketchUp. The default arc type is an arc, two point arc. Uh, and I will demonstrate how that point, how that is drawn. The guides with the, the lines and the dots are great indications of how the arc is going to be drawn. The dots correspond to your clicks, and the lines correspond to your cursor movement between those clicks. So on this specific example, you can see that a, the dots are all three on the on the arc, not on the center of the arc. So if I draw, I click on one point, I click on another point that forms the arc, and my third point determines how far out that arc is spread. And so that is creating an arc. You can create arcs in several ways, as you can see. This one's slightly different than the other one. Rather than doing the two opposite ends of the arc and then the center, this is going to do one end the center and then the other end. So one end, the center, and then the other end. So in this specific instance I drew a very big arc. There we go. That's a little bit more manageable. So you have several options for how to draw arcs. My favorite is the first option where you are clicking on the center and then two points in the arc. This allows you to determine the diameter of your arc or radius rather and then to draw that arc in that in that way as you draw the arc notice that where we saw in the lower right hand corner where when we were drawing the lines we had length now we have radius and then as soon as we click our second click it indicates an angle so we can specify the exact measurements of the arc that we're wanting to draw. If I click on the select tool, you can see that arcs function in a very similar manner to way lines functioned. That the lines, that the arcs are intersecting at the points where they overlap. If I didn't want these arcs to intersect, I would create groups of them before allowing them to overlap in this way. You should take this opportunity to uh, pause the video and to experiment with the arc tools. I'm going to go ahead and select all the arcs that we've created and delete those so that I can introduce the next tool. The next tool on our, on our menu is the rectangle tool. It also has a drop down menu allowing you to draw rotated rectangles, circles, and polygons. Let's start with the rectangle tool. If I click anywhere in my drawing space, I create one corner of the rectangle. And as I pull my mouse out, I am uh, able to see the rectangle that I'm creating. In the lower right hand corner where we previously had the length of the line or the radius or angle of the arc, we now see dimensions of the rectangle that we're creating. As I move about, we can see those dimensions change. If I hit the tab key, I can 
get I can highlight that I can highlight those dimensions and type in the specific dimensions that I want let's say that I want to create a four foot by eight foot platform I would type in four foot comma eight foot enter and that would create a four foot by eight foot rectangle that I could then use to create the the model of a platform and just like when we've created a surface using lines the parts of the rectangle are the inner surface that can be selected as well as the lines that create that that surround the rectangle so you can highlight and select those individually and if I delete one you can see one edge you can see that the surface goes away and that the three remaining edges are still seen I'm going to click command Z to undo as I create another rectangle you can see that the shapes interact in the same way that just like lines and arcs the intersecting surfaces become one so if I didn't want those surfaces to interact I'm gonna hit command Z to undo the drawing of that rectangle I would select that original rectangle I'd use command G to make it a group and I would no longer have a problem with my surfaces interacting they would be created separately from each other and would not interact in that way the rotated rectangle tool is great in that you can create a rectangle and then it will indicate how that rectangle is spun out in space and so you can see your compass it is added to your view in this case it's along the right it's along the red axes and so as I'm drawing my my rectangle it is going from the on the surface to being rotated out in space I'm going to go ahead and click undo do that again as I draw another rectangle I'm going to, this time I'm going to do it on the green axes and so now you can see that as I rotate around it's rotating up in space so this is a great way to draw uh, facing on platforms or uh, surfaces that are, are not flat against the floor and so that has now drawn a surface that is not flat against the floor other tools underneath the rectangle and the rotated rectangle are the circle tool which functions uh, similarly to what you would expect from the previous tools that you've seen as well as the polygon tool which functions similarly as well before you uh, click to uh, create your first po polygon when you first select the polygon tool you are s given the option to create the number of sides in that lower right hand input uh, information window the number of sides are indicated so if I hit tab I can say three sides and it now switches to a three-sided polygon and I can create different shapes in this way go ahead and take this opportunity to pause your video and to play with the rectangle and the rotated rectangle the circle and the polygon tools I will go ahead and delete these items from our field so that we can show the next tool All right, now that we've played with those shape tools, I'm going to skip a ahead a few tools to show uh, one of the most important tools uh, that, you'll, that you'll need to use. In fact, there's several tools. I'm going to cover the orbit tool, the pan tool, the zoom tool, and the zoom extents tool. Let's start with the orbit tool. If I click on that, and then click anywhere in the drawing surface, and hold that click as I move my mouse around you will see that I am orbiting or flying around the objects in that drawing space you can most easily tell right now with how the axes are moving around let's make this a little easier to see 
Let's go to that rotated rectangle tool and create a rectangle that is rotated up in space. And so right now our, our character is standing behind the rectangle and as I click back on the orbit tool and I fly around him, we can see how that object looks in three-dimensional space. You can roll up to be above the object. You can roll down to be below the objects. Or just rolling around to the left and right of an object. This is a great way to look at the creations that you are making and to determine how they fit together in a three-dimensional space. The next tool is the the pan tool. It looks like a hand. When I click within the drawing space and I hold my click and I move my mouse around, my cursor around, this is functioning similarly to the orbit tool but instead of moving around the object that you've the area that you've clicked on in a circular pattern this is moving in straight lines to the right to the left up and down so this is a great way to continue moving about the object and to to look at the object in different ways if you have a mouse with a scroller a clickable scroller you can set the settings on this so that you can click and move your mouse about uh, with the orbit and the pan tool quite easily. If you have a, this type of a mouse, I strongly suggest that you look into the functionality of these buttons. The next tool is the zoom tool. This will allow you to move in and move closer and further away from the objects that you're looking at. If you click within the drawing space, and hold that click down and move high move your your magnifying glass higher in the space it will zoom in and as you move lower it will zoom out this is a great tool to, to be able to to get in real close and to pull out to see the different uh, objects and their relation to each other if you're not on the zoom tool you can also just use the scroller of the mouse to zoom in and out the zoom extents uh, will button, when you click on this tool, it will fill your space with all of the objects that you have currently drawn. I'm going to use the scroller to zoom out and to demonstrate this a little differently. I'm going to draw a rectangle all the way out here in space. I'm going to zoom in and when I click the zoom extents tool, it zooms out so that I can see all objects that are currently in my drawing space. I'm going to go ahead and delete that other object, click the Zoom Extents tool again, and it zooms in to show me everything that I've drawn in this space. Go ahead and pause the video at this point in time to play with the Orbit tool, the Pan tool, the Zoom, and the Zoom Extents tools. Okay, now that we know how to move about the space, zooming in, zooming out, and rotating around, uh, let's look Let's hop back to the where we left off in the tool menu uh, with the push-pull tool. I'm going to go ahead and click on that push-pull pull tool and demonstrate its use. We have this rotated rectangle. It's, uh, we, we've already flown around it in the space. When I roll my mouse over it, it becomes highlighted. The surface itself becomes highlighted. If I click on it, and then I move my mouse away from it, you can see that I'm able to, to pull that surface into a three-dimensional object. I can also push in the other opposite direction to create a three-dimensional object. Push and pull. Notice in the lower right-hand corner that the distance that I'm pushing or pulling is able to be uh, specified using the tab key and typing in a specific distance. So I've now made that a three foot wide rectangle. If I had specified uh, dimensions when I created this surface, perhaps uh, a four foot by eight foot 
uh, rectangle, I would be able to even further uh, dimension this object to my desires. <clears throat> As I mouse over the different surfaces now, you can see that the push-pull tool can continue to edit this shape that I've created. I can select the top and push it down. I can select the sides and push it in. I can collect, select the front side and pull it out even further or push it in further. This allows me to edit that shape. As I click on my orbit tool, I can fly around that shape to see what it looks like from the different angles that I've created. Now, the push-pull tool only works with surfaces. If I have a line, I cannot select that line to be push, pushed or pulled. So it has to be a surface. It can be a surface that is connected to a 3D object, or it can just be a surface that does not yet have a three-dimensional space to it. This is a fun tool, so let's go ahead and pause and allow you to try it out for yourselves. The next tool in my tool lineup is the offset tool. We don't use this tool too terribly much for what we're doing, but possibly you will. This tool creates copies of lines at a uniform distance from the originals. Let me show you an example to best illustrate what this does. If I select this surface that is surrounded by four lines, it is enclosed by four lines, if I click on it, as I move around inside that surface, it is creating a duplicate of that uh, of that object of that surface, the four and the four lines that create it, and I can create that within the original or beyond it. In this case, I'm going to to select. I'm going to zoom in, and I'm going to create it within the original. Notice that again down in the lower right hand corner, I can specify a specific distance. In this case, I want two inches. So now I have a new rectangle within the original rectangle that is two inches within its borders. I can then use my push-pull tool to subtract that, that rectangle from the overall shape or to add on a new rectangle. Now, these shapes are interacting in this way because the surfaces that we drew were interacting in this way. If we did not want to be able to subtract or to add on to the shape in this way, we would have had to make groups. But since we didn't, we can play with these shapes in this way. So you can see when I brought that, let me go ahead and undo. When I brought that push-pull, to the to on the edge that made it so that it no longer existed because it brought it from the top all the way to the bottom had I gone past that in my push pull I would now have that lower shape that's been created but instead of doing that lower shape I liked it when it just disappeared so I'm going to bring it down to the end point and notice that I, I used the, the guides of the outer object as a way to bring it to the points I want. I know that I want to bring it down to a level that is equal to the outside edge uh, of that object. And so if I move my cursor to around that edge, that will snap to that point. That will bring that edge of that surface that I'm pushing and pulling level with the edge of the outer shape. So that that is a quick and easy way of lining those things up. So that is the push-pull tool in combination with the offset tool. The next tool in the lineup is a great tool. This is the move tool. The move tool allows you to uh, select an object 
In this case, I'm selecting that face just by clicking on it. And then as I move my cursor, I'm able to move that surface. If I don't want to just move the surface, I clicked undo to undo what I was doing. I clicked command Z. If I select that whole object, that the combination of all these surfaces and all these lines, so they're all selected now, I can click and move that that object. As you can see, it's kind of twisting the shape because I missed one part of that object when I was selecting it. So I'm going to go ahead and undo, zoom out a little bit, select it again to get the whole object. Now notice as I when I click to move it, I can click on the object to move it from one place to another, or I can click away from that object and it will move it in relation from the first point I click to the second point I click. This is a great way that if you want to move an object along a line that it is not connected to that you know is for example in a certain direction or a certain distance it makes it very easy to do so. So to demonstrate this if I wanted to move this object in the same direction as this line in the same distance I could click on the end point of that line, move it along that line, and then click on the other end point of that line. And I have now moved that object in the direction of that line, in the, the same angle, so parallel to that line, in the same distance of that line. This makes uh, moving things, oh, and as you can see, just like when you are drawing rectangles or circles or lines, if your surfaces touch and, and intersect, they will function in that way in a very similar way to when we are selecting them, that when we're moving them, they will pull those objects along. It's a little easier for me to demonstrate this with just a simple line. So if I intersect those lines, like we saw before, if I select the different parts of that line, if I select one part of that line and choose to move it, you can see how it affects the other parts of the, those lines that intersected with it. It will pull that intersection and twist and distort those lines. So this is a, a very dangerous thing uh, that you can now see why it was so important that we don't have some objects interacting. If we know that we're going to want to move an object around, we likely don't want it intersecting with the objects around it. So I'm going to go ahead and control Z to, or command Z to undo a few of those commands. And I'm going to select that shape that we've created, that three-dimensional object, and I'm going to group it. And so now when I move it, I can move it right on top of another object and when I move it away, it does not intersect. Had I not grouped it, if I command Z to undo those that grouping, and I move it to within that shape again, now when I move it, it's going to pull apart that shape. So this is a great example of why we love that command G to group, so that when we move things around, they don't get connected and intertwined in a way that we don't want them to be. The next tool on our lineup is the rotate tool. When I click on this tool it gives me my little compass, my little protractor, and it allows me to select objects. So let's go ahead and I'm just going to select this whole group and I'm going to click on my compass tool and it allows me to rotate that object. And it's going to rotate from the around the point that I initially click. So I want to rotate it around it, this corner. So I click on that corner and notice that when I when I'm hovering over it that I can get the compass to change colors. That indicates what plane or what axes axis the that point that you're rotating around is perpendicular to. So right now 
or perpendicular to the blue axis. So if I rotate around with the blue highlighted, it will rotate around on the plane that is perpendicular to the blue axis. So this is the ground plane. Had I clicked while it was highlighted in red, I would be rotating around in a plane that's perpendicular to the red axes. So rather than on the ground plane, I'm rotating it around that red axis. As I sh rotate around that object, you can see what that spinning, what that rotation did. I'm going to quickly undo and demonstrate this again. Uh, now that I've, I've rotated around the object a little bit more, when I put my compass up to my rotating compass up to the object, I can see I now have the option to rotate around the green axis. And so if I rotate now, it will be rotating on a plane perpendicular to the green axis. So again, that is clicking on the point that you want to rotate the object around, clicking on a, uh, a secondary point to grab the object, and then moving your mouse or cursor around to rotate the object. You can also rotate objects around points that are disconnected from the object that you're rotating. For example, if I wanted to take this object that's currently selected, but I wanted to spin it around this point away from that object, connected to another surface, I can click on that, that area to select the point of which we'll be rotating around, click on a secondary point, and then as I move my cursor around, that first object that I wanted to rotate will now spin around the points that I have selected. This is great if you uh, maybe you have a revolve and you're wanting to spin the revolve and you want to the point that things are to be so moving around to be the center of the revolve. This will um, allow you to do such an action. Go ahead and pause your video to play with the move and rotate tools. The next tool in our lineup is the scale tool. With an object selected, I can click on the scale tool and it will give me a bounding box around that object, a three-dimensional bounding box in this case, since the selection is a three-dimensional shape. And it will allow me to, by clicking on the corners, it will allow me to increase or decrease the overall scale of that object. Notice that the lower right hand corner instead of length or dimension or angle we are given the option to indicate the scale. So when it's at 1 that's 100%. 1 1.5 is 150%. 2, 200%. If I hit tab I can specify a specific amount. I'm going to go want to go 2.5 or 250% of the size of the original object. As you fly around, you can see that it changed the, the scale of all surfaces and lines associated with that selection. Go ahead and play, pause the video, and play with the scale tool. The next tool in our lineup is the tape measure. This is a, a great tool to use to find out how big the objects are that you're creating. Using the measurement tool, it looks just like a tape measure, I can find out, for example, how far away from this line is this object. So if I click on the line, I can click anywhere on that line, and I can move my tape measure to the object, and as I mouse over it, I don't need to click, it will give me a pop-up dialog box that indicates the exact distance. In this case, it's 7 foot 10 and 3 quarters of an inch. If I click again, it will make a measurement line at that point. 
these don't go away and they're kind of hard to see so I often don't like to have to have these in my drawing because they they get distracting and you're not sure exactly what they're for and when you're clicking on them they're just it's just a dotted line so I'm going to go ahead and delete that but by using the tape measure and not clicking a second time I can get a measurement hit escape and it won't create that dotted line for me and I won't have those those weird uh, distracting shapes uh, around if for example if you look at your instructor window it gives an example of when you might want to use the tape measure if I wanted to draw a square within this box and make sure that is one foot from this edge I could use my tab tool to or my tab key to indicate a specific length of one foot and that will draw that line at one foot down if I then wanted to draw have the the upper side the upper line of that square that I'm about to draw to be one foot from the top I could do that again and that would create a corner that I can an intersection that I can easily mouse over and using my rectangle tool to use that intersection to create my square or my rectangle I could then easily go and delete the measurement lines that I had created in a way that they don't interact very easily had I done lines at those specific points I would have to delete multiple points of that line because they would have interacted with the overall shape. So that is an instance where you might find the measurement lines of use or of value. Typically though I advise against doing them just because you often will forget that they're there and you'll have to delete them later and sometimes they get grouped with things and it's just it's just an overall pain in the butt and we don't want to do it. The next tool is a text tool. We're going to skip that one as well as the paint bucket tool. These tools are, are great tools if you are using this SketchUp creation uh, or this, this SketchUp drawing as your final drawing and you're wanting to make notes on it or color it but we're not going to be doing that. We, we are using SketchUp solely to create an overall image that we're then going to draw on top of. So we're, we're going to skip those tools. The last tool I want to point out is probably the most exciting tool. This is my favorite tool. This is the Git Models tool. We're not going to look at the Extension Warehouse or the Send to Layout tools. Those as well as the Text tool and the Paint Bucket tool are not uh, important to our, our use, nor is the add location tool. So the text tool, the paint bucket, the add location, the extension warehouse, and the send to layout tools are not important to us for our immediate needs. We might talk about those in future videos, but at this time I don't need you to know how to use those tools. The Git Models tool, however, is the coolest tool available. When you click on the Git Models tool, it will open a, a new window. Let me resize it so that it's within our... Uh, actually, I'll, I'll zoom out so that you can see the overall, because it's a little bigger than my working window. This is my 3D Warehouse window. And the 3D Warehouse is great because it is it requires an internet connection but it connects you to a warehouse of stuff that has been created on SketchUp. So anything that you need is likely already created in the 3D warehouse. Let's say that you are creating a, uh, a set that takes place, your set is in a living room. And so we want to put a couch in our set. And instead of creating your couch, with the rectangle tool and the line tool. You can do those things. You can use those tools to create your couch. Or you could go to the 3D warehouse and tell it that you want a couch. 
And so I just typed in the search window there, couch. And as you can see, it pulls up a variety of couches for me to choose from. Lots and lots of couches that have already been created in SketchUp and have been uploaded and shared. So other users are creating these these couches and sharing them in this Google or in this 3D warehouse. SketchUp used to be owned by Google, so I will often call it Google SketchUp. It is no longer a Google product. It is a Trimble product, as you can see down here in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, but me and a lot of other people call it Google SketchUp just out of habit. And so let's select this sectional couch. And when I click on it, it gives me a closer view, some information, terms of use, and some uh, options. If I click on this uh, orbit option, I can actually orbit around the sectional sofa, or a sectional couch rather, before I do anything else. I, I, can, I can see it in 3D within this 3D warehouse. And then if I want to, I can click download, and it gives me the option to load this directly into my SketchUp model. I can click OK. And now it brings me back to my, my SketchUp working window and allows me to place that couch wherever I so desire. I'm going to just put it back there. As you can see now that I rotate around it, I orbit around it rather, I fly around it, you can see what that couch looks like. And so this is a great way to put scenery uh, within your design, within your three-dimensional space. Maybe the couch that I'm actually going to want for my show is a different color or has a different back shape. This is a great way of putting the general shape within your model so that you can then print out what that looks like from the specific angle that you're going to be viewing it from. And then you can redraw it, but without having to redraw the whole thing from scratch. So maybe I'm drawing over that object and changing that couch. I just wanted to get the couch in this specific relation to a person so that I could see how big it was with a person standing a specific distance from it at a specific angle to the viewer. That concludes the tools that I was hoping for us to cover in this introductory video. Go ahead and take uh, the opportunity now to experiment with the tools that we've learned. Uh, the 3D warehouse, the push-pull, the different shapes. Uh, figure out how these tools work. Uh, give them a, a good test drive before advancing on to the next tutorial video.